Apologies for starting late today. Uh, we've had a flurry of activity. It's Parliament sitting live this morning and the Minister has just headed off for a division. Uh, so there's a lot of action going on with our eminent speakers that have joined us. Today I'm joining you from Canberra, the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. For our Australian audience who join us from different parts of the country, I would like to acknowledge the land of the first Australians who, uh, who you meet with us on, pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as the emerging elders, uh, some of whom we work alongside at ANU. Thank you for joining us today for the fourth Big Pictures series panel discussion. And I'd like uh, to particularly extend a welcome to the many audience members who are joining us from across Oceania. During the 2020 bushfires, people from across the Pacific committed Defence Force personnel and funds. Prime Minister Morrison acknowledged the loving response from our Pacific family. Now the Oceanic region faces a new set of challenges. While many Pacific Island countries have managed to close their borders to keep out COVID-19 cases, all countries are facing a growing economic crisis in part due to the lack of tourism. Many countries are severely impacted by Tropical Cyclone Harold. These challenges prompt the question, what does our shared regional future look like in a post COVID-19 world? Does it involve some of the following? Inclusion in the Trans-Pacific bubble as a pathway to economic recovery greater recognition of the ongoing impacts to the region caused by climate change, longer term and more flexible seasonal worker program opportunities. These and other important regional issues are going to frame our discussions today. Uh, I'm James Batley from the ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs. And before we get underway, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel to you all this morning. First, I'm delighted to welcome from Samoa, uh, the Honourable Fiamme Naomi Matafa, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Natural Resources and Environment. Great to have you with us, Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, from Fiji, I'm delighted that we've got uh, my old friend, the Honourable Ayaz Syed Kayum, Attorney General and Minister for Economy, Civil Service and Communications, and I believe also the Minister responsible for climate change. Uh, from Australia, we're also delighted to, uh, to have the Honourable Alex Hawke, who's had to step out just briefly because Parliament's sitting and there's a division. He will be with us momentarily. Uh, Alex Hawke, as I'm sure you know, is the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, as well as being the Assistant Defence Minister. So it's great that you could all join us this morning. Uh, a very warm uh, welcome to you all. Uh, and I'd like to start our discussion this morning by asking our Pacific guests if they could describe to us briefly the effect that, that COVID-19, or I suppose the COVID-19 response and lockdown has had on your country. Um, how is that impact being felt uh, in your economy, in your society. And good morning again to everyone uh, joining this session. I think Samoa's uh, experience of COVID-19 is very much the shared experience globally um, with the impact of the lockdown um, and how that has affected uh, our economies. But um, perhaps so in, in addressing the COVID challenge, um, we have had to have a look at our capacities within our health systems. Uh, and, that, and I think that is the, the priority. Although we are COVID free, um, the weaknesses uh, in our health infrastructure is such that we have to ensure that we do prepare uh, in case um, COVID does arrive in Samoa. But secondly, um, also how we can prevent it, especially since uh, there is no cure so far. So just following on, James, with uh, repairing, um, you know, is having to then coordinate uh, our responses. 
not only internally with our health infrastructure, uh, but also with the regional and international communities to assist us, um, especially uh, with supplies. Now, we had the measles outbreak in Samoa, and we were very fortunate with the international personnel that was able to come to Samoa. But I think the COVID experience is such, and we're seeing it internationally, it is going to be very difficult uh, to expect um, to have uh, international personnel, you know, access to countries. Um, so essentially the supplies have been around, um, the coordination has been around uh, supplies. Uh, this has been through the Pacific Humanitarian Pathways and also, of course, um, the bigger tower uh, agreement within the region, and this essentially is more, you know, the political cover um, to the coordination and the work that's being carried out, and uh, also to ensure that if there are blockages in terms of those humanitarian pathways, um, that that particular uh, provision at a regional level uh, can assist that the, those pathways are clear uh, and running. Um, just on the economy, um, of course, uh, our governments uh, in the region, we, we've all had to respond in different ways. Um, the sizes of our economies and our capacities, of course, uh, dictate what we are able to do. Uh, with our government, um, essentially our stimulus has been around uh, utility subsidies, uh, business loan subsidies for our private sector, some capital injection through the development bank for particular sectors, agriculture, Ooh. infrastructure, uh, fisheries, uh, and so forth. Um, ensuring that the public sector employment um, is intact and filling vacancies so that people uh, have a, uh, a wage. Um, and also, you know, contracting, uh, and this is, has to do with uh, government spending. I think one of the things that I do need to just speak briefly to. And I think the experience will be different in the different uh, economies within our region is the whole concept of social security. Now, with larger economies, you have more capacity to offer formal social security provisions, um, wage subsidies and, and so forth. For smaller economies like our own um, and in other uh, challenging times, you know, we do fall back on our customary safety nets. Um, and you will find now with uh, uh, job loss uh, that people are returning um, to the land. Uh, and we're fortunate in, in, in that we are able to do that. Our size um, enables us to do that uh, more easily. But nevertheless, I think we have an, a shared experience of our populations in the urban areas you know, where there is complete dependence on wage for livelihood. So there has been uh, some efforts uh, from the government for uh, wage subsidies and so forth. But I think we need a little bit more vigor um, to, to look after that particular sector. So um, I think um, I might just stop there. I, I know we have a three minute uh, allocation, but that's uh, just a brief response to that question, James. Thank you so much, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, Attorney General, how's, how's the situation in Fiji? What's the impact been there? Well, thank you for that, and um, also hello to all the other panelists. Um, you know, you know, we had uh, 18 cases, uh, positive cases of COVID-19. Uh, they were all essentially brought in from uh, overseas. We had a couple of people coming from um, Australia, New Zealand, and also from India. Uh, and then, of course, then they uh, you know, transmitted that. The, uh, we've managed to bring it all under control, and we now no longer have anybody with any positive cases of COVID-19. So, you know, technology being used COVID-free, but uh, so far, we'd like to be a bit more cautious and say we don't have any positive cases in these. Uh, as seen by the New Zealand experience just a couple of, uh, couple of days ago, whilst they declared themselves COVID-free, they've now got two cases, uh, people apparently who have not necessarily followed the protocol with the quarantine, which essentially demonstrates you know, how fluid the situation is and how we still need to be very cautious about it. Um, we, of course, you know, um, we carry out large-scale fever testing throughout the country, uh, and also I think that's what helped stop any local transmission. 
And uh, we also took very stringent controls in respect of border control, um, you know, in terms of stopping flights, in terms of lockdowns in specific areas. You know, Lotoka was locked down and we had the first case. And Suva was on a lockdown. And then parts of Guadalupe was on a lockdown. That obviously has an economic impact domestically speaking, of course, because you know, the gyms are no longer open, the pubs aren't open, the cinemas aren't open. That is an impact, of course, again, on government revenue. The borders closing, of course, means that it will be much bigger. Impact. You know, nearly 40% of our GDP directly is dependent on tourism. So an enormous, you know, um, impact on our revenue stream. In anticipation of it, when we first had the first case, we, we realized what, what were the implications, indeed, the ramifications of it. So we put in place a supplementary budget. We had to re reconfigure our budget, and we had what we call a COVID-19 budget response. Um, which meant we reduced some of our expenditure, but also became a lot more realistic in respect of the revenue streams. So, I mean, going forward, of course, our financial year begins on the 1st of August, uh, so we're preparing for another financial year. And, um, you know, the, the shutting down of the borders, and hopefully now with the opening of borders, which leads us on to the second question, it can, you know, offer some ray of hope uh, regarding that. It has enormous impact. We expect our economy to contract by at least 21%. Uh, initially, we thought it would be about 4% um, because, you know, the tourism sector is simply not open and because of the fact that many ancillary sectors depend on the tourism sector. Um, but it's not just tourism per se. I mean, we obviously have, uh, have a fairly healthy garment industry. So when New Zealand or Auckland and Sydney is on lockdown, there's obviously less demand for the garments. It's predominantly supply to Australia and New Zealand. So there's less retail sales, means less demand. So, you know, their workers will be sent home. I know it's work probably only one or two days a week uh, and reduced hours. So that's the impact of it. I mean, I think in respect of the uh, positioning of Fiji vis-a-vis the testing, uh, we are up there with Australia in respect of the you know, uh, testing of, for COVID-19. Fiji's number of COVID-19 tests per concurrent case is about 214.7, just a few percentage points less than, than Australia and New Zealand. And also, of course, in respect of the Fiji's average daily COVID-19 testing for a positivity rate, one of the most reliable measures of whether government's testing enough was, again, about half a percent right up there with Australia and New Zealand. So I think in that space, we're doing well. Of course, as the Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa did highlight, you know, it made us focus a lot more on our health system in terms of anticipation. Should there be an outbreak? Uh, what are the uh, emergencies we have in place? With the reconfiguration of our budget, we, of course, then had to uh, allocate a lot more money to the Ministry of Health, you know, uh, basically procuring equipment, etc., in anticipation of an outbreak. So I think going forward now, of course, we are more, you know, um, um, attuned to opening up the borders. Uh, we hope that the Honourable Prime Minister in the next few days will make some announcements in respect of the lockdowns domestically and perhaps some movement, uh, you know, internationally, what, what are some of the protocols we want to put in place so we can start opening our borders. Uh, we, you know, it, it's interesting because during all of this, we also had a cyclone, uh, you know, a cyclone herald. So the uh, majority of the, um, of the bulk of these sort of winds actually went through the maritime areas down the southern and eastern parts of Fiji, you know, Kandavu and Lao. And so to be able to, you know, bring emergency supplies, take emergency supplies and all, all the other sort of relief uh, efforts, we had to, in the meantime, ensure that none of the COVID-19 you know, possible cases would actually transmit to the maritime areas. And, you know, thankfully, uh, by the grace of God, none of that happened. But of, of course, it meant a greater sort of, you know, awareness in respect of the logistics and also in terms of cost. Obviously, the increase in the cost because you cannot do things a lot more freely in a large scale. So I think, in a nutshell, that's where we are. So we were approximately 25% of the workforce have been affected by the pandemic. So we have a superannuation fund that uh, relaxes some of the uh, withdrawal, uh, you know, schemes. Government is then topping up in, in respect of that, and we have to ensure that there is uh, sustainability in all of this. Thanks very much. If I could just follow up, um, just on this question of international borders with both of you. Uh, obviously, a lot of talk uh, about the trans-Tasman travel bubble, but also the possibility of including Pacific Island countries into, into a broader travel bubble. How important, how much of a priority is that for your governments? And, and what's your sense of how close we might be to achieving that? 
Um, James, uh, I mean, for Samoa, our key entry points are uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, and American Samoa. Um, so, of course, we're very much keeping an eye on what's happening in um, those um, four, four points of entry. Uh, we've opened up with American Samoa because uh, they're COVID-free. Um, we do, of course, appreciate, um, and um, Minister Sayed Kayum has uh, talked about, um, especially with tourism. And, uh, I mean, many of us uh, are in that same position. And, of course, when you talk about tourism, you're necessarily talking about travel and opening up. Um, I think our approach would be a cautious one, although we do recognize um, that in opening up, we start with our neighborhood, so to speak. Um, and I think that there are good signs um, of, of countries coming out um, of the COVID infection. Um, so we've started, we pet, we, we're bringing back uh, Samoans from New Zealand. Um, we've had three flights so far. Uh, we're some of we're negotiating with passage through New Zealand from Australia or possibility direct uh, and so forth. Um, and of course, you know, Fiji being, you know, a hub for, uh, you know, Pacific activities and especially uh, regional agencies and so forth. I mean, you know, it, it's very critical that that link uh, also opens up. But in brief, uh, we're a bit more cautious. Mm. How about Fiji? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, 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 in fact, we, we're working on some, uh, some, some papers at the moment, and as I said, we are on board PM and be making some announcements uh, very soon uh, regarding that. But I think as a matter of general principle, uh, you would assume that when you have uh, countries that have got, you know, for example, testing facilities uh, domestically, and there is a lot of transparency in respect of the, of the numbers, the statistics, um, and there is you know, third-party validation. And if countries are then declared to be COVID-free, I think then uh, travel becomes a lot more easier, and I think can be facilitated a lot more easier. So, you know, in, for example, if New Zealand is, uh, that contributes about 17 or 18 percent towards our tourism arrivals, if they are COVID-free, and, and Fiji is COVID free, then you would think that certain protocols in place, you could allow some travel, um, you know, as opposed to perhaps, you know, in this, at this point in time, as you know, that Australia and New Zealand are talking about a trans Tasman bubble. There are various, of course, you know, nuances within Australia itself with different states, different approaches, uh, and uh, perhaps that may be, you know, uh, delaying the trans Tasman bubble. I'm not sure about that. I, I just read an article. I think this morning or last night about the Australian Prime Minister making some announcement. No, no, sorry, one of the Minister Bingham, I think, uh, saying that uh, uh, there may be somewhat delayed. So there are different kind of, you know, uh, noises in, in respect of that. But we obviously are very keen with various protocols being developed. Uh, as the uh, Honourable DPM of Samoa did talk about, you know, within the Pacific itself, uh, there could be a uh, mechanism through which if we have various protocols developed within the Pacific Island countries, uh, we could, you know, uh, develop some sort of a, a hub, uh, you know, inter-Pacific hub um, between the Pacific Island countries because there's a lot of trade that takes place between the Pacific Island countries. There's also the movement of people. Um, uh, and, of course, different agencies are based in the different Pacific Island countries. Uh, for example, the uh, Foreign Fisheries Agency is based in Samoa. If the people from Samoa want to travel to Fiji and other Pacific Island countries, so there be various protocols developed, and then perhaps that can be facilitated. But I think the the, the word, of course, you know, the, the, they, they do say that the most predictable thing about COVID-19 is its unpredictability. Uh, and I think, you know, that's why everybody's been very cautious about this. Uh, and uh, somebody needs to take the first, I suppose, not leap, but perhaps first step uh, to be able to, you know, open up these corridors. And they'll be quite keen to explore those. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, I note that Minister Hawke has joined us. So I wonder, um, Minister, if you could perhaps speak to the kind of commitments that Australia's made to the region recently in, in relation to COVID-19, given its special status to our family, as our, as our family, but also uh, we've just heard from the Pacific leaders 
the importance of thinking around the mooted trans Tasman travel bubble. So if you perhaps could touch on that as well, that would be helpful. Uh, these are very important topics. I think we all understand the uh, difficulty of the pandemic and what's happened. I, I just want to commend uh, everybody uh, in the region for the very strong and swift action we've taken. I mean, the Pacific has really set a standard for the world in the sense that, you know, we've got it under control, we've got it managed, whether it's New Zealand, Fiji, Australia, Samoa, uh, we're doing a great job together um, and our, our efforts have very much been directed at working together with the region to make sure um, we get as prepared as we can be for whenever the health um, impacts do reach us and uh, we, we, we will have them reach us sometime when we need to be as prepared as we can be. So our efforts have been focused on that. Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on some of the things we've been doing and uh, in partnership with uh, uh, the countries in the region. And uh, then I'm very happy to go to travel bubbles, all of the important topics. Um, our Prime Minister's made it clear from the very beginning, um, treating this as a pandemic in, you know, in advance of um, the World Health Organization's uh, recommendation, that we wanted to take it very seriously because it was not just going to be a health uh, crisis, but uh, a twin crisis. And the, and the second crisis is the economic crisis. And I think now we're, we have the health crisis under management and uh, on close watch. But of course, the economic crisis is the one that we'll have to be dealing with. And regionally, you know, that's, uh, that's just as severe as anywhere else. And uh, we're very focused on that. So um, you've seen the Australian government uh, reprioritising our budgets in partnership with countries. Where, wherever we've had money that now can't be spent because we've, we're unable to travel, programs are unable to go ahead. Um, we've been very quick to say how much is that money uh, we want to spend uh, in a way that will make a difference to the health system of, of ordinary people in the Pacific and also um, support governments in, in you know, the, the great challenges of getting ready. And we've seen very advanced countries in the world be completely unprepared um, and struggle to catch up and be ready. So every country in the whole world has a, a very significant challenge. So that money, I think, has been well spent and reprioritised uh, to support health systems uh, and we'll continue to do that. And, and obviously, as we get the, the right drugs, the right vaccines, the right uh, health equipment, we'll be working with countries to make sure as much of that can reach uh, all the systems in the Pacific as quickly as possible. Um, so then uh, Partnerships for Recovery is the uh, flagship program that uh, Maurice Payne, our Foreign Minister, and myself announced um, as well. And Partnerships for Recovery is about tackling uh, what is going to happen next uh, for everyone in our region. Uh, and uh, we're working closely with countries right now on the details of um, our country plans. Uh, we're working on our regional plans uh, to take account of what has happened and how we can best spend money in a way that um, enhances recovery, that uh, puts a floor under uh, the difficult economic conditions that are now a semi-permanent state uh, for the region and the world. And that means, you know, less travel. It means uh, less uh, availability of capital and capital markets. Um, and that's why I think Australia has also put a premium on uh, in the international forums. Uh, our Prime Minister has spoken out very strongly in favour of the Pacific uh, receiving more assistance from international financial institutions, um, getting it quicker uh, and uh, being considered in all the policy considerations of multilateral banks, um, United Nations for vehicles, and I myself have been participating in um, a group of international development minister calls uh, regularly um, of countries all around the world, drawing attention to the Pacific region and saying, we need to really uh, focus our efforts on uh, helping all parts of the world so uh, there's a lot of work to do there, and I know um, I know countries in the region have been using their voice as well, and I think regionally we'll continue to use our voice um, uh, through the Pacific Islands Forum and other um, uh, other counterparts to make sure uh, we're getting attention on on what is going to be quite a serious economic um, uh, you know situation coming up. Uh, so I look forward to all the ways we can uh, work together through this. Um, we're very conscious of the fact that as a Pacific family. Um, we're, we're disconnected now and some of the very strong measures we've all taken have actually worked to separate us, uh, separate us physically, but also to separate us economically. And um, we respect the calls that we're hearing from people to uh, start the work, the policy work on how do we reconnect in a way that is safe, um, that can enable uh, economic development to continue. Um, in Australia, we're working on some of the flagship programs that we've got. Um, so the Pacific Labor Scheme, the Seasonal Workers Program, we've uh, changed the conditions so that people who are here can stay uh, for another year if they want to keep working. 
we've uh, changed the conditions so that um, uh, people here can be moved to different jobs if, if, if we have tourism you know, uh, problems, the same as every country in the region, but they can be moved to other sectors. Uh, and uh, we're looking at a way to make sure we can keep bringing people here uh, throughout this crisis now. We're working on that right now so that the Pacific Labor Scheme and the, and the Seasonal Workers Program can continue and the opportunities are there. Um, they're going to, we need more numbers. Uh, we won't have the same amount of uh, backpackers and food students and people coming from anywhere else in the world. So we do see a big opportunity for the Pacific to come in, in greater numbers to Australia and uh, work and remit money and, uh, and obviously get skills and, and go back home as well. So we're working on that part. And then very importantly, uh, going to your, your point, Siobhan, about the Trans-Tasman bubble, uh, that work is well advanced. Um, we're in constant uh, dialogue with New Zealand on a daily basis at the moment. Uh, that is progressing well. Um, every country has their challenges with COVID at the moment and, and disruptions. Uh, the Prime Minister said we're going to get this bubble up. Um, ones I think are going to partner countries have. And some countries out there, I understand, don't want to reconnect with Australia at this time. And we're very cognizant of the fact that we have um, we're going to have a low level of COVID cases for, for some time to come. We haven't pursued elimination um, and, and we're not going to be able to achieve elimination. So we have to, we have to think hard about the conditions and get the policy right. But it's relatively fast in governmental approach. And I, I know my colleagues here will understand what I'm saying um, in terms of the governmental approach. We should be able to have the trans has been bubble up and running in the very near future and then start to add on those countries that really would like to. Fiji has, has obviously been very vocal and very committed to this, We're ready to do so and obviously a pace as well. Some questions and things we wanted to discuss. I was a little bit late. I apologise about that, but so over to you, Siobhan. The next question I want to move on to is, is thinking around climate change impacts in the region. Uh, so we know recently discussing the impacts of COVID-19 and Tropical Cyclone Harold. Dame Meg Taylor, the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum has said, and I quote, COVID has shown us our vulnerabilities, but climate change remains the single greatest threat. And this sentiment echoes re previous statements by the Pacific Island Forum leaders that climate change remains the single, the greatest security threat in the region. So the question then is how do Australia and the Pacific create a shared future with attention to the growing climate change impacts on Pacific countries? And I wonder if I could open up to you, Attorney General, knowing that you also have carriage as the, of the climate change portfolio in, in Fiji. A lot of people have, you know, there's been a bit of discourse regarding climate change vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. And there's also a huge, um, bigger focus on COVID-19, generally speaking. I mean, we, we've got articles coming out every two hours on the internet and some experts writing on COVID-19. And it may appear that climate change has taken a back seat, but it, it, it cannot and should not. Um, this was obviously highlighted to us with Harold in the midst of the COVID-19 cases that we did have. You know, just, just to highlight it, um, since 1993, sea levels in Fiji actually have risen by about six millimeters per year, which is about double the global average. Um, just in the past few days, uh, our PM has gone into about three different villages where they've uh, you know, put up new seawalls, and these things all cost money. But obviously, it's, it's uh, highly uh, symbolic of the fact that climate change is very much here. This is supposed to be our dry season. It's been raining every day in Suva uh, for the past, you know, umpteen weeks. Uh, reality of the matter is that the, you know, climate change is a reality. And we cannot actually, you know, um, lift our foot off the pedal. And uh, the fact of the matter is that in response to COVID-19, there may be an urge by a lot of people, you know, for economic growth to perhaps drop the guard on climate change. And that is our concern. We cannot do that. We need to continue to focus on uh, the next COP, as you know, that's been deferred um, uh, in, Bla in Glasgow still, but to next year. Uh, Fiji, for example, and is very much a great advocate in respect of the, the UNIF C process. Uh, but of course, at the same time, apart from that uh, UNIF C process, the, the Paris Agreement process, you know, on a daily basis, uh, the fact of the matter is that it's a reality. The fact of the matter is that we need to build resilience in our infrastructure. Uh, it does cost money. Of course, now with COVID-19, 
uh, with the revenues you know, drying up. Uh, we, we, in fact, uh, you know, left, left in the economy, but we cannot actually let, let the guard down on climate change. We cannot compromise, for example, environmental standards. You know, we've had people say to us, well, why don't you drop the guard on environmental standards? Um, yeah, because, you know, we have a pandemic on. Last week, Fiji signed up with the UK initiative of 30 by 30, uh, which is, you know, uh, getting 30% of your EEZ uh, area into uh, the ocean area, into reserve, marine protected areas. Now, we're very much keen on that uh, because the reality of the matter is that we, uh, you know, the sea or the ocean, the mangroves have much uh, greater carbon sequestration rate. We need to be able to protect the, uh, the marine environment. There's an enormous impact in respect of the livelihoods of people who live off the sea. So we need to engage uh, in, the, uh, in the protection of our ocean areas, protection of reefs. So tourists come to Fiji because they love snorkeling. They like the, you know, pristine environment. Now you cannot kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Because if you don't have that environment, if you don't protect, uh, you know, or stop the acidification, then obviously there's an impact, much greater impact on the overall economic uh, productivity and output of the country. So in short, I mean, I, I realize we uh, don't have that much time. I think the reality is that we need to be able to collaborate uh, across the board. Uh, we, we cannot, uh, you know, let, like I said, lift the foot off the pedal regarding climate change. We need to persevere, persevere with it. Uh, Fiji is looking at various options. As you know, we, we uh, issued the first green bond from an emerging country. Uh, we're now looking at a blue bond, perhaps later on uh, down the stream, because not a good time to go out into the market, I suppose, at this point in time. But it most definitely do all the groundwork for that. And, you know, I have to also acknowledge the fact that uh, we have been working with uh, our development partners, Australia included, in some of the areas uh, regarding the oceans, and we hope to further those uh, engagements. We are just last but not least, we are in the process of um, the second round of public consultations on climate change bill, and we are fine tuning that, which will also lead to a lot of better ways of, you know, terms of carbon trading, uh, and which will be, uh, you know, great. Uh, I suppose a source of revenue, but also in terms of the overall impact of reducing uh, carbon throughout the world. I wonder, Deputy Prime Minister, would you like to add anything from a Samoan perspective? You know, in, in asking the question about Australia and the Pacific, the shared future, you know, you are talking about that collective. So perhaps I can take a more a regional approach uh, or a regional angle to, to the discussion. Um, so this is not new. Uh, we're all members of the uh, Pacific Forum. Um, and, you know, we have platforms and, and, and vehicles by which we carry our message. I don't think anyone will disagree uh, that within the context of COVID-19, that somehow the climate change issue will take a back seat. In fact, um, it should give us more impetus to put it more to to the future um for now and the future um uh, because you know we're talking about pandemics um but the the impact and effect of climate change uh impacts us in in all uh aspects of our lives including health as well um so i think you know we i you know people talk about COVID, you know and it's a new norm it might be a reframing, but I think the picture is still the same um, in terms of um, our lives and how we, we want to continue with that. So just coming back on the theme uh, of our regional approaches, um, of course, the, the, the forum has the Blue Pacific Continent 2050, um, and more pertinently to climate change, we have the Kainaki 2 uh, declaration. And I think the point I want to make there is that the Pacific has advocated very strongly that climate change um, become part and parcel of the whole security discussion. So I think we've been at the forefront of that and we should keep it up. Um, but primarily, um, I think um, moving forward, um, we should not lose uh, momentum in terms of the Pacific advocacy um, in the area of climate change. Um, and I think it's very uh, important for Australia um, as a member of the Pacific Forum um, that it comes in uh, strongly. Um, and as one of our uh, larger 
uh, members uh, with the, the Pacific and the message, um, you know, to ensure the 1.5 uh, objective that we've been advocating for, uh, that we raise the global ambition uh, with regard to emissions. Um, you know, COVID now, talking about being disconnected, um, when we're not able to have the COP, and we were uh, very much anticipating that this next COP uh, we could conclude uh, on the rule book um, for the Paris Agreement. And I think all of us um, ha have been anticipating this, and um, although it might be delayed, I, I don't think the momentum, and I know that through the UNFCCC processes, that there are still ongoing nego negotiations uh, to uh, forward that work. Um, I think also, you know, through the um, climate change processes, it gives us opportunities also to find new partners, um, not only to address climate change, uh, but also, you know, the economic um, benefits that could uh, fall through uh, from those uh, arrangements. I just want to uh, speak briefly about the Pacific Resilience Facility. Um, you know, financing is one issue, and I'm sure my colleague from Fiji is a lot more uh, knowledgeable about uh, the financing on climate change. Um, but why I wanted to make mention of the Pacific Resilience Facility is that you know, it brings uh, that financing component um, into a, a, a more um, um, usable um, way of um, not only accessing, but also working through the, the financing that are made available. You know, it's targeted, it's contextualized uh, for the Pacific uh, context. Um, it speaks to the, the small, and small scale uh, because quite often uh, with financing arrangements, uh, you know, small countries get the word, well, you know, your projects are not big enough. So, you know, I think um, uh, we should pers uh, persist uh, with the development of uh, the Pacific uh, Resilience Facility uh, concept, um, and especially also for simplifying uh, the processes. I mean, a lot of us, um, you know, there are capacities uh, in our respective uh, agencies and uh, governments uh, to be able to, to work through those. So I think having that considered um, attention uh, on developing this particular financing uh, facility will serve us very well. Um, I think uh, just on, on climate change and where the priorities are for the Pacific, most of us are still on renewable energy. Um, and I think in that, we have opportunities also to develop, develop new industries um, for ourselves. So um, moving from the electricity sector into transport, both land and maritime. But I think uh, we might also be looking um, in that link between energy and waste. I think those are opportunities uh, available uh, to us uh, in the Pacific. Now, you know, we're, we're talking about the Pacific. We're the stewards of the largest ocean in the world. Um, you know, there are other um, groupings. Uh, you know, we hear of the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's still a bit of a mystery to us. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we have these uh, configuration and circles that overlap. Um, and I think, you know, as the Pacific uh, also, you know, pooling our knowledge, and this is where I think Australia, uh, with its particular reach, uh, the minister was referring to some consultations he's, he's been having with other international ministers. I mean, you know, th these are all uh, windows um, that can be made available to our uh, neighbourhood, so to speak, or our Pacific family. Uh, through the participation of uh, some of our uh, members in all these different uh, forums. So just coming back in terms of the Pacific Ocean, uh, we, of course we have Asia. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole other area with the South America, Latin American continent. Now that's a continent that hosts, you know, um, you know the forests that, you know, can save us 
ores, although it's very much under risk. Um, but there are opportunities there, I think, for us to make new partnerships in that direction. So the next question is one that we've received a number of, of uh, questions around, um, which is a very important regional issue that's been creating a lot of media coverage over the last week in the region. And it's the significant governance issues that are being raised at the University of the South Pacific. Obviously, the University of the South Pacific is an extremely important regional institution. It's one that has trained a large number of Pacific leaders. So I would like to say, how can we move forward in addressing these concerns? Um, you know, this is an institution that is highly valued throughout the region. Um, it has served us for, you know, 50 years. Um, many of uh, the graduates uh, of uh, USP, you know, have uh, come to serve their countries, have, you know, been leaders in their respective countries. Um, on, on the current um, governance issues, um, I'd just like to say that the council is holding a special meeting tomorrow. Um, and I think that's where the, the matter should sit. And hopefully, you know, the, your minister mentioned, the, you know, disconnections. So um, the council has not been able to meet um, physically. Um, the, the meeting, uh, there was a meeting due in, in May. Um, uh, but now I think, you know, through, uh, you know, the technologies available to us, we'll be holding that meeting tomorrow. Uh, and hopefully council will play its role um, as the governing body of the university um, to bring some resolution to the issues. Um, that are in the forefront. The Prime Minister of the University plays a very, University of South Pacific plays a very important role. Um, it's been, uh, you know, a uh, source of many uh, leaders in, in the Pacific. Uh, the Lodala campus here in Suva is the largest campus out of all the uh, different campuses uh, strewn across the Pacific Islands, the campuses, you know, for example, Samoa and Vanuatu and various other Pacific Island countries. And, uh, you know, Obviously, good governance is very important, transparency is very important uh, for the future. And I think that these are the issues that need to be resolved by the council. And the, the council is meeting tomorrow. And hopefully, you know, uh, that's what the council will do. Um, you know, regarding the, the future of the university, I think it's critically important that uh, the council works a, a way forward, that we don't have this kind of issues that have arisen in the past you know, year or so. Uh, because we need this university. Everybody needs this university. Uh, Fiji has two other universities. We have our own national university. We have also a private university. But the USP still plays a pivotal role. I mean, it has, for example, a number of schools uh, and faculties that don't necessarily exist in the other two universities. They don't necessarily have the level of experience or depth uh, and the expertise. So the University of South Pacific plays a very pivotal role. And the only way for universities to survive is obviously to ensure that it's uh, it's, you know, uh, based on good, good government structures. Uh, so I'll hand over to James now. Thanks, Siobhan. We, we've, we have heard back from uh, Alex Hawke's office that, again, there's another division on uh, in Parliament. I guess this is an occupational hazard of uh, holding a meeting during a sitting week of Parliament. But uh, one of the things that, uh, that Alex Hawke mentioned in his earlier remarks was... Um, the uh, labour mobility schemes, the, the seasonal uh, worker program and the Pacific labour scheme. Uh, and he seemed to suggest that there would be increased uh, flexibility introduced uh, into these schemes. I just wanted to ask our, uh, our Pacific uh, guests um, how important these schemes are in terms of your own economies and, and your own societies. And are there particular things that that you are looking for from Australia or New Zealand for that matter, in terms of uh, increased access, increased flexibility, um, particularly once we move beyond uh, the immediate COVID uh, phase that we're in? I was quite encouraged um, by uh, your, your minister's uh, remarks with regards to the RSE, especially in the current conditions. Um, I think um, it, it, it's uh, 
very comforting, um, the approach that Australia uh, has taken to, to people who are there now. Uh, and because of the lockdown, are not able to return. Um, I'm very pleased that they are able to be re redistributed to perhaps other sectors um, and that the work is available. Um, I think, you know, the point still needs to be underscored um, that, you know, the, this scheme is a two-way one. Um, it meets our needs, but it also meets, uh, you know, the particular labor needs of uh, Australia um, and New Zealand. But I think one of the, the, the things that have come out of the current situation um, is the protection uh, for RSE workers in the situation like we're in now, you know, and what would be the protocols. And like anything else, uh, unless it happens, we, we don't really know. So perhaps uh, this is an important um, thing. Uh, Australia seems to have uh, responded very quickly. Um, I think uh, New Zealand is, is slightly different, so we're working through those. Um, but I think from our perspective uh, at the moment, um, uh, you know, we, we should be perhaps, uh, you know, defining exactly the status of uh, these kinds of workers. You know, um, we talk about essential uh, workers um, in this period, um, and so the categorization uh, and the pro protocols and protections, I think, is uh, an area we we do do need to look at. Um, of course, the scheme um, has uh, you know changed over time. There's flexibility. There are different optionings uh, depending on the on the skill level and 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 what is wanted. Um, and and I think you know that serves uh, the interest of uh, sending and receiving parties. Um, it does play a very significant um, uh, function uh, for the um, economies of, of the sending countries. I know that myself uh, from Samu. Um, I had gone to an event last year. Where every year, there's, you know, with the returning parties, you know, the, the sending villages uh, have a, a, an event to welcome them. But the reporting from that was quite incredible, you know. And for this particular district, uh, with perhaps, uh, you know, thirty thousand uh, population or so, they were having an, you know, uh, an injection of close to eight million tala, you know, our dollars. Um, into um, that that community, and that's enormous. Um, and of course, the impacts will be felt um, if if the situation changes um, with the situations that we are in now in uh, with the COVID. But we like it. I think you know it's uh, it, it's uh, worth looking at um, and to see how we can improve the scheme as we move forward. The fact that the Commissioner said that these workers have ended up saying their lives is obviously much appreciated. That thing does make a lot of sense too. We will have some workers, for example, in uh, Pacific labor schemes that we've engaged, uh, for example, in resort work. We had some in the uh, Cable Beach Resort, uh, some in the Hayman Island, they were working there, in the uh, hotels there. Uh, but they were moved to, you know, aged care uh, sort of facilities where they were you know, obviously continue to work and some went to meat works where the services are required also. So I think that ability and the level of flexibility, I think, is very much appreciated. Um, and of course, going forward, uh, you know, feed is very key to ensure that uh, we work with the various protocols and, uh, you know, provide employment uh, opportunities uh, for our people, as the Minister highlighted from somewhere, that uh, there's also benefit for us in terms of remittances. I think there's an opportunity also to uh, not just focus on the agricultural sector, not just on the seasonal work program, on the Pacific labor scheme. Uh, there were, I think, uh, some who uh, went to, you know, places other than the Eastern Seaboard of Australia, there's some talk about workers going to Northern Territory and perhaps even uh, Western Australia. And of course, we've got some of the results through Northern Queensland. So I think there's an opportunity to do that. We had, unfortunately, some people who were uh, supposed to leave and they had resigned from the existing work. They went to Northern Australia, but of course, with the travel restrictions, they, they could not. Uh, so we have to deal uh, with that situation. 
But I, I think um, our assessment is that there will be a demand in Australia uh, for a lot of these uh, people to come in once a year. But for example, uh, the agriculture sector opening up and also the hospitality sector. Uh, and given the fact that there has been a downturn in the hospitality sector in Fiji, there may be there are more immediate opportunities for our people in the hospitality sector in Australia. So we look forward to further talks on that. If we're coming towards the end now, and if I could just put a final question uh, to both of you, and I, I understand there are still divisions ongoing in the Australian Parliament, so we may not see Minister Hawke again, but all, all of our speakers this morning have talked about uh, the impact of, of COVID on borders and around the region and, on, and indeed on the regional, the pattern of regional meetings and, of course, the, it looks like the Pacific Islands Forum, the leaders' meeting this year. Uh, itself will will be delayed. But so I guess what I wanted to ask you was that what's your sense of what what this this whole COVID uh, crisis has meant for the region? We've got a really good sense from you of what it's meant uh, for your countries. Um, but has it uh, it's been a challenge for the for the regional organisations? And, and where do you think? the region and regional organisations will be placed as we come out of, uh, of this uh, situation in, in coming years? I think, James, just take this session as an example. It's definitely a, a new way of work, you know, for um, the different agencies. But like anything else, you know, we need to adapt. So um, I understand there has been... Um, mixed uh, experience in terms of using the new technologies. Um, but I think, you know, if this is the thing that is available to us, um, then it's very important um, that we do um, make the investment um, to ensure that these platforms, you know, um, uh, can avail us the opportunity to, to keep those connections. Um, having said that, it's, it's quite interesting, um, you know, in, in the whole COVID thing, I think it's, it's given us all, and this has been the global uh, experience, I think, and I think for smaller countries, you know, it, it's uh, given us some uh, opportunity to reflect also. I mean, in economic terms, you know, when, when the connections are cut, then first and foremost, you, you're looking internally, you know, how, how do you keep that? internal uh, e economy turning over. So, you know, um, and, and that just depends on the, the, the different circumstances. Um, but it may not be such a, a bad thing for us to be reflecting and, you know, uh, working where, with what we can control, um, perhaps uh, reprioritizing, uh, because I think that, you know, in, in, in any event where we're challenged, you know, it, it all, everything is there, but perhaps it's the prioritising that we need to to um, reflect on. If I could sort of take a leap out of what the Honourable um, DPM said, I think the regional organisations obviously uh, will continue to exist. Uh, the platforms they use for engagement obviously will change a lot more technological engagements. And of course, there is in itself a, a need there to... Um, beef up the technological capacities in the different countries. Uh, you know, some months back we talked about certain countries not necessarily having the right bandwidth, you know, to be able to have such a conference. So, so that in itself is an issue that needs to be addressed. And of course, our development partners can work. And the regional organizations will have a you know, pivotal role in, in perhaps, uh, you know, spreading the use of the technology and building the local capacities. Um, I think also the regional organizations need to have perhaps a more we require them to play a more nuanced approach in respect of how they deal with the different countries. Because I think what the, the pandemic has also highlighted is the different, you know, positions or different uh, capacities that the individual countries within the region have. You know, what, what, for example, one may be advanced technologically, the other may not be. Now, this we need to assess vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs too. And we have the SDG goal by 2030. Uh, the reality of the matter is that when it has a when the pandemic has a huge strain on the revenue or ability to build capacity to meet the goals of SDG by 2030 is again limited. So I think the regional organizations to 
uh, you know, maintain its, its relevance and for the uh, individual countries to be able to obviously leverage off the uh, regional organizations, there needs to be an understanding, a more nuanced approach about the individual country situation and tailor-making for those individual countries. Of course, there are certain, you know, uh, certain areas where you need to have uh, a one-size-fits-all uh, for all the Pacific Island countries. But I think in order for the individual uh, regional organizations, but then it's also a lesson for the development partners. When they do use the regional organizations, they need to you know, highlight to them and uh, they want the programs to be actually be, you know, delivering the right uh, you know, outcome. They need to be able to you know, talk or relate to them about what do they want and how the individual countries are dealing with the different situations and build those capacities individually. Because you know, the reality of the matter is, for example, you know, uh, using Fiji as an example, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we should not have depended so much on tourism. Because of the fact that we depend so much on tourism, this is why we have such a huge hit in respect to government revenues and our tax revenue. So, yes, it's true. Uh, we were, in fact, for example, for example, the tourism sector, our past number of years, our goal has been to, and the mantra has been saying, spread our risk within the tourism sector, and, and that is not depend so heavily on Australia and New Zealand in terms of the percentage of the arrivals. Of course, we have to grow the numbers, but we need to look at other source markets, you know, whether it's more growing the North market, the European, the Chinese, the Indians, the emerging markets. And of course, therefore, the connectivities need to be a lot wider. So we fly directly to Singapore, Japan, San Francisco, LA, et cetera, Hong Kong. So that's one aspect of it. So what can our development partners and regional organizations do, for example, to build capacities in, in, you know, in, in creating new um, employment opportunities. That, I think, is critically important. I mean, one of the areas that we are looking at is because we've got a very young population, because of a very high level of penetration of technology, you know, whether it's uh, Facebook, et cetera, uh, and smartphones. We have over 600,000 smartphones in the population of 900,000 people, who are 70% of the population are below the age of 40. So perhaps we need to look at things like coding, building capacity in our university. So, you know, our students, our youth can actually go and learn coding and we can provide services now remotely uh, to San Francisco. Uh, the vendors can actually come and see the products here, the people who develop the products for them, and then fly back directly. So those are the things that we need to look at. So what can the regional organizations do to build those capacities together with our development partners like Australia? Um, Siobhan, I'll hand back to you now for, um, to, to close up. Yeah, look... Thank you for what's been such an insightful and thoughtful conversation today. We've covered such a wide range of issues and it's been, um, it's been really wonderful to hear firsthand around um, your opinions, but also perspectives of, of directly from the leadership around, around how COVID-19 has been impacting your countries.